debt profile is helping us to reduce our average interest cost to around 7.8% in this quarter compared to 8.6% last year. Our debt equity ratio has sharply reduced to 1.49 from 2.12 same time last year. Similarly, net debt to underlying EBITDA has improved to 4.11 times in this quarter. Over the last six months, we have been in discussions on the in-wit transaction and it has progressed very well and we are close to finalization of the binding agreement. We are very happy with the progress achieved till date on this transaction and given the size and complexity of the portfolio and expected, we expect to approach the board for approval before the end of this month. In Prayagraj, we continue to see very strong operational performance achieving a 92% availability in this quarter. Tata Power is also providing the O&M services, which has led to the improvement in the Prayagraj plant operations. We have also continued to see meaningful progress in Odisha Discom, which operates in the erstwhile Sesu area, and we have seen significant improvement in operational and financial parameters to reach our targeted trajectories. We have been able to reduce the trippings at 33 kV levels by more than 70% while replacing almost 1.2 lakh meters till end December. At the same time, we are working on improving the customer experience with better customer care centers, uh, call centers, and better customer relationship management solutions as, as also uh, starting many initiatives to reduce the customer complaints on payments and billing. In our consumer-oriented business, we won contract to provide charging infrastructure for e-buses in Ahmedabad and best buses in Mumbai. Our solar pump business did installation of nearly 2,750 pumps this quarter, recording its largest quarterly revenue. Our rooftop solar business continues to emerge from the COVID-19 induced slowdown and we have seen an uptick in the orders. Unbuilt order book for rooftop solar as of end December stands at nearly 600 crores. Our microgrid business has also seen huge progress with our 100th microgrid commission in UP. We have already in the process of installing another 28 microgrids and another 62 are under advanced stage of installation. In this quarter, we also commissioned two biogas plants and thereby taking efforts to make these microgrids 100% on the renewable power. The coming quarters will be action-packed for the company and we look forward for your continued support. Uh, uh, my colleague and I am available now to take the questions. Uh, I now hand over the call to Faisal for questions and answers. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use the handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Swarnim Maheshwari from Edelweiss Securities. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi, sir. Good evening. Congratulations for a good quarter. And uh, I have a couple of questions, sir. Uh, so the first question is actually if you look at uh, on your Facebook business, so if you can tell us what was the ATMC loss at the end of Q3 and also with respect to SESU, what were the uh, losses at the PAT level which is actually implied in your consolidated numbers? The, uh, for SESU, the PAT numbers included in the consolidated number is 34 crores for the quarter. Okay. 
What was your other question? KTMC loss. loss. Uh, exited with widely we exited with 33.9. Sorry, 33.9. Yeah. Sir, yeah, if I recollect, uh, at the end of Q2, uh, the APNG loss was at about 27.5 or 28 odd percent. So, is it fair to say that in, in Q3, the APNG loss has gone up? No, no, no. Q2 and Q1 were higher than 33.9. In fact, we are on a slope. Uh, from Q2, we achieved 38.7 for the quarter. So when we exited with 33.9, obviously the actual would be much lower. We would have 20, about 24, 25 is the for the quarter performance, so to speak, to bring down the cumulative to 33.9. So I don't know where was the gap in your numbers. You read something, some different number, but maybe offline we could help you with that. Sure, sure, sure. I'll just recheck that. Uh, so, second thing is, uh, you know, you we have mentioned that there is this forex loss in the Solar Business TPSL. Now, uh, what is this loss pertaining to? Uh, is there some sort of uh, foreign loan over there? What is it? No, no, this is by, by module. So, for modules, okay. uh, this is for the module. you do the so, forex booking, so it's uh, MPM impact. So, what is the quantum? No, the you you know the seventy percent of the input cost is the input module. I say is uh, oh quantum of the loss is about eighteen crores. It's about eighteen crores during the quarter. But this it is includes you know periods beyond the quarter because when as and when the depending on the valuation at the end of the uh, MPM valuation at the end of uh, the quarter, this is the eighteen eighteen crores the impact. Some of it could could recover also. Okay. Okay, all right. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mohit Kumar from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Good evening, sir, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, I have a few questions. The first is uh, on the expected timeline for you know announcement on the invit. We when do expect to close the you know uh, the invit and uh, the 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 in megawatt terms, how much asset we are looking to hive off, and the bid of the assets and the life of the asset left. This is the first question. So, um, well, transaction close. There is time because there are a lot of steps. There are shareholder approvals, regulatory approvals. Etc. The first thing, of course, is to have the the basic structure agreed upon. Uh, so, which is what we are uh, just now, Mr. Sina mentioned. We are close to finalizing that, and uh, we hope to announce that soon. And thereafter, of course, it will go through the regulatory approval process and shareholder approval process. And as long as your uh, as far as your megawatt answer is concerned, we expect to. Uh, put about 3.4 gigawatts uh, in this whole uh, uh, mechanism. So, our intent is to put all of our renewable assets, uh, barring some which have to stay back due to some reason, um, but otherwise all the renewable assets will be transferred to the invite. And out of which 3.4 gigawatt, how much is operational at this point of time? So 2.7 gigawatt, am I right? Yeah. Understood, sir. Uh, secondly, on this uh, solar sales and models business, uh, we have commissioned the new capacity. So, what are your aspirations in terms of you know solar sales and model manufacturing for medium term point of view, and uh, and the and the order book which we have right now on the Tata Power Solar, is it uh, is safe to assume that this entire order will be executed in the next uh, couple of years? Yes, because these are all generally uh, 18 to 24 months duration. And, and therefore, of they will continuously being uh, will be executed in the next uh, one to two years. And so, what are your aspirations in terms of solar cell and model manufacturing? Do we have any plans to go to ingot wafer, and do you want to increase this capacity? Is it something which, uh, or it is just you know? Can you so, at present, it? we are also looking at how the appropriate uh, environment for the solar manufacturing will shape up, and uh, we are also. Uh, looking forward to the uh, support from the government on the 
various manufacturing related incentives and i think once an appropriate uh, regime is there then we would certainly look at that right now there is no immediate plan in hand to move in that direction last question sir are we perceiving munda tariff resolution given that the you know, coal the cost of the coal has again moved up and the crc has is open for business well um when well, well, right now crc is not in the picture as you know first it has to be approved by the five states and that approval process i think we have informed in the past there are some terms and conditions on which uh, it is stuck and we expect that unless those are resolved um, it will be very difficult it doesn't make sense for the company so uh, so we will re- we will respond as and when those uh, conditions are resolved understood sir thank you sir and all the best thank you the next question is from the line of puneet from hsbc please go ahead yes thank you so much for the opportunity on the uh, solar uh, etc business side should one worry about the margins given that we seen volatility in the uh, module prices and all is that something that you were impacted with as well well when you are in this business volatility is part of the game so we do have we do have plans how we normally even out these things because this keeps happening right this is not new of course after a long time prices have uh, began to look up but there are also expectations that this is a short lived uh, phenomenon so so but uh, suffice to say that uh, as a business we we will we will uh, of course use all our tactics to ensure that we um, kind of time our uh, entire management of the contracts in a way that we suffer the least so all that many of the contracts are firm prices right? and uh, it is hedged also the currency hedging is done so to that extent we do uh, uh, get insulated from these market forces but i presume most of your contracts would have a module element also into it and w- would there be a way to go back to the customer and ask for a commensurate higher price or is that not no no, no. no. So you cannot go back to the customer but what one can do and what we normally do is also tie up on back to back basis with suppliers from china and other locations so it's not only that everything comes from china we also source it from some other countries also and uh, to a large extent we are insulated from these market forces okay so you would have tied up mostly that one needn't worry about because it is a thin budget is not there yeah absolutely right my second question on sesu what kind of trajectory should we look at you are already down to 33.9% what do you think would you be in the fy 22 and then 23 how should we think about this trajectory you've seen the trajectory which is given i think it has been shared with you in the presentation the whole idea is that we should be better than that and that is what we are currently planning to do and and they're on track yeah and if you see we started from a very high number because uh, uh, of covid uh, during the period april may the uh, atnc loss went up to nearly 41 42% which we have now brought it down and uh, going forward uh, we have shared with you that what is the track time the trajectory that we will have and we are definitely expecting that uh, it will be much better than what we are Uh, projecting my last question is the government has talked about an alternate uh, reform is that something that you see could happen in immediate future or would there be a need for regulatory changes to take place so these type of changes uh, first of all it has to be passed in the parliament so the bill has been introduced and uh, we do not know how much time it will take whether it will go to the select committee or it will get passed in the parliament itself secondly uh, the, the rules and regulations for the doing all this has to be clearly spelled out both by the central government and also the state regulators but uh, this will happen maybe in a year or two years time and this is a great opportunity for us uh, because of the unique experience that we have in carrying out distribution services customer service that uh, we provide to our customers so i think it's, it's a good opportunity in, uh, going forward and we will try to extract the maximum benefit uh, 
when it opens. But, and and the states would also have to separately agree other than just the uh, centers. Is there understanding? Uh, yeah, there is a consultative process. Uh, distribution of energy is a concurrent subject, and states have to be on board as also the regulators. Great. That's all for myself. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anupam Goswami from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. So my first question is on Sesu. We posted a profit of 34 crores. So what led to this profit? Uh, I mean, I have to understand. Have we a break even uh, already? No, no. So, so there is a on the in, on the base equity there is a ROE. That is point number one. And point number two is there are adjustments of the uh, on a cumulative basis. Um, the recoveries, etc., which are pending recoveries, etc., which are getting made, the recoveries of old use, there is a incentive for that, and also the recognition of the provisions for uh, 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 debtors, those are adjusted at every quarter and depending on the progress made. So this includes some amount of the progress belonging to the past six months also. Okay, apart from the regulated equity on the uh, invested equity. Okay, uh, got it, sir. And so my next question on the Tata Power uh, Solar, uh, we have achieved a higher revenue, uh, but our PAT has gone down. That is uh, what you mentioned about a MTM losses of 18 crore. Is that uh, the reason? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is correct. That is correct. That's yeah, that is because uh, part of the execution could happen in this quarter. The balance execution will happen in the last quarter, and then the total uh, pack will be full. Okay, okay. And so, uh, uh, what is our X ETC uh, revenue in the uh, Tata Power Solar? What is it? What is your revenue of uh, X ETC? Uh, so in this quarter, the uh, 900 crores was the total turnover for the company, which is the EPC arm, of which EPC is 649. Okay, okay, got it, sir. So my last question is on the uh, startup our standalone. So I see we have uh, increased our short-term debt for that. Uh, what is the reason for uh, increasing debt? No, this is more, now we are tactically planning to eventually uh, come with a proper long-term versus short-term combination. Right now, due to the fact that in the last four or five months, we raised capital, we sold assets, and now we have to plan to refinance and repay uh, some of the debt. Therefore, in the, in the coming months, you will see that a lot of the short-term debt will get uh, slowly phased out into long-term debt. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Got it, sir. Thank you. I'll turn back this in the been, This has been something which is on our radar for the last uh, six months. Even if you compare in March, the amount of short-term debt we carried versus what we carried in December, there is a mass decrease of about 3,000 crores. Okay. Okay, sir. Got it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kirti Jain from Sundaram Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. So my first question is with regard to the uh, Gujarat solar policy which, is, which has come. Uh, how has been initial response, if you have got any, uh, on that front? And then with regard to charging installations, like in next uh, 12 to 15 months, what is the uh, charging installations are we planning to achieve in the next 12 to 15 months time, sir? So, uh, based on the Gujarat policy, whereby they have said that they will sign up PPA with individual uh, power generating individuals, uh, they have been a very good response from what we understand from Gujarat government. They've got nearly uh, 5,000 applications of people who are interested. They are uh, right now scrutinizing those applications. Uh, many of the people who have applied are in touch with us because they want us to carry out the EPC work with them and also the O&M activities. So 
uh, we are looking at a great opportunity over there to support the investors, individual investors who would like to take up uh, these type of generation program in Gujarat. Uh, so what about captive uh, consumers, sir, like large uh, industrial houses, chemical factories or the ceramic units? Are they also coming into uh, sign the PPS or what? Or yeah, sign the agreements? That, that uh, is a part of our uh, risk of business whereby we are tying up with them either on pure EPC basis or group captive basis. So again, uh, there has been very good orders that we have received in the last quarter and we are seeing huge amount of traction in uh, uh, these type of industrial and commercial establishments who would like to go for uh, rooftop solar solutions and uh, we are also now coming up with large initiatives and uh, publicity campaign to, uh, uh, to reach out to many more consumers in different parts of the country to see that how the benefit of self-generation through rooftop uh, can be provided to these consumers and their electricity bill can come to that extent. So then on uh, EV installation, uh, cha charging station installation, sir, what, what is the number we are targeting for the next 12 to 15 months? So right now, we have nearly 300 uh, public charging stations that we have set up. And uh, we expect uh, to complete this year by with nearly 500 charging stations. And these are fast uh, charging stations in public locations. Uh, we also have done nearly 2,000 home chargers. And uh, going forward, uh, these numbers, uh, I think, uh, will be shared with you in terms of huge growth potential. And uh, we will be playing a very, very important and critical role in providing these infrastructure throughout the country. Okay. That's the last question from my side. So yesterday, uh, one of the uh, news I saw that uh, the AP bidding happened and uh, at 2.48 also, we didn't win any project in the AP bidding. And second thing, uh, uh, NTPC is able to uh, uh, take our service and uh, is able to supply at 2 rupees, whereas we are not participating in those uh, solar tender. Any particular reason, sir, in those two aspects we didn't uh, do, sir? Yeah, so first of all about the AP, uh, we found that the AP bidding is being done without uh, consent from the regulator. And uh, also the uh, agency which is doing the bidding is not uh, uh, is not authorized to carry out these sort of bidding. It has to be a distribution company which has to do that. So, uh, so that's why we felt that uh, the whole process is not very transparently done and we would not be in a position to bid in that. Secondly, as far as the uh, competitive bidding came, uh, we normally bid in all projects and uh, you have seen in many of the recent projects that we have bid and we have competitively won those projects. And uh, we keep on assessing the market and based on the opportunity and what sort of return realization that we expect, we normally bid and we win in those contracts. Uh, so in terms of the solar pumps, uh, how has been the response or any numbers can you share on solar pump side, sir? So this year uh, we have, uh, uh, we shared with you that in last quarter we implemented some 2,750 pumps and uh, we have a very good order book of uh, solar pumps. Uh, this year we have uh, 7,500 uh, uh, numbers have been implemented and we are expecting that in future, because of the huge push that Government of India is giving under the Kusum program, we'll be doing more number of solar pumps going forward. That's one of our growth businesses apart from roof also. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Modi from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, Thank you uh, for the opportunity, sir, and uh, uh, congratulations for good set of numbers. I just wanted to take your view on uh, the bidding landscape in the solar projects, and we've seen a lot of hybrid projects are also coming up. So, sir, what are the kind of uh, bids that you are looking at in the next means opportunities that are coming across uh, 
uh, on an annual basis uh, realistically uh, on, over the next couple of years? Right. See, now, uh, what has happened is that in last one year, because of COVID, uh, not many projects have come up. Uh, and as you know, that the government of India has a plan that by December 22, one lakh seventy-five thousand megawatt of renewable will come. Uh, we are still at ninety thousand, so there is a huge demand to catch up in next uh, one and a half years on on little less than two years to uh, meet the target of one lakh seventy-five thousand. Uh, we are seeing that uh, the, many of the state governments, as well as uh, SECI and NTPC. Uh, have plans to not only come up with just pure uh, solar or pure wind projects, but also hybrid projects uh, where uh, they will come along with storage or will also come with a combination of thermal projects. So we are looking at a big opportunity. The second thing is that, uh, again, uh, the RPO obligations for states uh, has still not been enforced. Uh, the new amendment to the Electricity Act is talking about enforcing the uh, RPO obligation. Uh, we are still at uh, about 10% of our total energy coming from renewables. If we have to become 20%, then uh, the capacity addition has to be much larger than what it is today. So uh, considering all these things, we do expect that uh, there will be a lot of traction in coming months on uh, uh, not only pure re uh, renewable, but also high risk projects. Sure. So, uh, so just wanted your view on one thing. Like recently, Gujarat went in for this. Uh, uh, Gujarat regulator asked uh, Discom to consider the retendering, and you know, it's a very peculiar situation that every two months uh, bids are being called and prices are at least 20 paise uh, lower than the previous bid, and ultimately we are with a 20,000 megawatt of unsigned PPAs by various agencies. And then we are at a two rupee tariff, where obviously the participation is thin. So, sir, what is your view as to how will this deadlock get resolved? Because uh, at some price, someone has to sign. So, uh, what's your view on this? It's uh, typically uh, these type of things do not happen. These are aberrations uh, which happen, and this is for the first time that uh, Gujarat regulator, instead of adopting the tariff, uh, has asked them to re rebid. Uh, again, uh, the proposed uh, amendment in the Electricity Act says that uh, under 63, if there is a bidding done, uh, the regulator has to adopt that tariff and it cannot uh, reject uh, whatever tariff has been uh, determined through a bidding process. So I think uh, uh, both uh, through the regulatory system as well as uh, the amendment to the Act uh, will push uh, uh, the regulators to comply with the normal bidding norms rather than uh, making knee-jerk decisions of modifying the, the bidding process. Sure. Uh, sir, uh, now in terms of uh, discounts, uh, is there any, any discussions that uh, you are having with uh, the policymakers and uh, the states, uh, any particular states who are looking to privatize uh, this comes over the next 12 to 18 months, at least initiate any process in that regard? See, we typically are in constant touch with the various state governments and we share with them the opportunity to reduce losses, provide better reliability, better service to their consumers. So this is an ongoing process on a regular basis. And these decisions are taken by the government based on their uh, uh, desire to implement uh, the reform process, the timing of it uh, is uh, determined by when they have elections and when the government would be in a position to take a hard decision. So uh, this is something that uh, on a constant basis we connect with uh, all the state governments. Okay, so and no specific uh, states which are currently being talked about or there are and uh, but it, it, it's uh, fluid. It's very speculative at this stage. Yeah? Right. Very difficult. It is at different levels and different stages of discussion. So very difficult to say at this stage. Right. 
sir, and so my last question is with regard to the revenue model of the EV charging ecosystem that uh, we are developing. Sir, how exactly does the entire uh, scheme work in terms of our revenue model? Is it just a power sale or uh, how does it work? No, it's a combination of power sale, services, and a uh, network. So they will be charged for the network. So therefore, it's a combination of all three, um, and, and plus there will be some value-added services thrown in. So at this point, I think we will not be able to share the full model because some of it is evolving. We are doing a lot of seeding work in the market, and as we go along, a lot of refinements will happen in this model. So will this be a licensed business or uh, now obviously the de-licensing is passed then it's passed but typically will it be a license? No, there is no such sign. I think the government all it is doing is to encourage uh, more and more near penetration and since there uh, many of the private sector players may not be clear about um, how it will move ahead, they they are pushing a lot of government um, uh, efforts also into this. But overall it will be a uh, uh, to, our, to the best of our knowledge, it's all going to be open market because ultimately it's all about penetration. So everybody has to chip in there. Sure, sir. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aniket Mittal from Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Um, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so a few questions on the EPC front. You know, firstly, if I look at the EPC order book um, which you provided on slide number five, and if I adjust it for the in-house projects, you know, there is a very large concentration that you have towards NTPC projects. So I, I just wanted a sense, you know, from a broader EPC market perspective, you know, is there any reason for this? Um, I, I mean, are there are the other RE developers sort of doing the EPC work in-house? Yes, I think many of them are doing in-house. Okay. So, just from a sustainability perspective, would it be fair to assume that the sustainability of your order book would be dependent on these PSU projects able to uh, win awards and then, you know, contract it for, for EPC work? Not necessarily, because there would be new and newer players and many players would also change their preference to do it through outside contractors, depending on the size, scale, and their ability to execute. So therefore, we expect this market to continuously evolve. And as new players come in and new investors come in, they may like to actually go with established EPC players who will provide them a more assured um, EPC service. So this is going to be a growing market. It is not only dependent on PSUs. OK, sure. And um, you know, just one question on the solar rooftop front. Now I understand you know, this is a you know, very big segment for us where we're expecting strong growth to come in. But, uh, you know, with the recent mandate for net metering uh, restrictions, uh, one, how do you see, uh, you know, the market sort of going forward? And what sort of installations are you looking at from an FI22 base? Well, that's Net metering. <clears throat> Rooftop net metering. <laughs> it's asking what does it mean when you can get the latest uh, line line on See, the, the uh, net metering concept was brought in when the cost of uh, rooftop solar was 14, 15 rupees. Eh? And at that time, to induce uh, uh, people to go for uh, rooftop solar, the net metering was brought in. Today, the cost of uh, rooftop solar has come down drastically in the 4 rupee range. Eh? So, uh, for consumers, eh, whether they are industrial or commercial or even domestic, the arbitrage for generating on their own is uh, much better and uh, they typically are now generating enough to meet their captive requirement and not uh, for the purpose of uh, giving it to the grid and getting the net metering benefit. So I think uh, conceptually the whole structure is changed but uh, otherwise uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a huge demand that we see in the market because uh, at the end of the day, today, the industrial and commercial consumers end up paying about 9, 10 rupees, while if they do captive generation, it is about 4 to 5 rupees. And uh, they will uh, tremendously benefit if they go for rooftop solar. Okay, so, but 
just to has a kick it in uh, get an idea from the next couple of years because you know the problem is what happened is is, is based on the uh, recent guidelines they said that net metering will only be allowed for loads up to 10 kilowatt right and i think there's a reluctancy for for consumers to actually go on a gross metering basis so from a next let's say two year perspective uh, what sort of um, you know installations do we see on the solar rooftop front yeah there the, the, there will be lot of demand uh, the gross is something which has happened globally everywhere the, when there was a large penetration of the rooftop solar uh, the gross metering has happened so uh, this is something which will transition over here the net metering will have a sunset and uh, we we need to see that uh, when it actually yeah. but it will push up the prices a little bit yeah. the market will readjust So maybe just to get a sense from the numbers over here, could you tell me on a nine-month basis what's the revenue and EBITDA from the solar rooftop segment? Uh, nine-month solar rooftop, we made uh, revenue of about three hundred crores. Okay. What would be the EBITDA? At present, we are not disclosing rooftop to be done. So uh, some of the new businesses which are nascent. uh we are not disclosing a bit dark because they are in very early stages uh but i think at a appropriate time we will start disclosing i think it will be better we start it systematically before we selectively answer this okay. and and um, maybe just one last question on the rooftop front because i just wanted to understand the model over here uh so let's say the installation that we do is it is it largely a capex model or an opex model we are both okay Okay. depending on what the consumer wants okay and uh, could you provide just some uh, sort of a uh, visibility in the chip from an fi 22 perspective what would be the total installations that you're looking at for tata power so we won't be able to share that right now but at the at an appropriate time should we decide uh, we will be sharing it okay sure uh, so my next question is, is on the sesu front could you tell me what's the overall cash at sesu Sorry, overall. The total cash, cash and cash equivalent at present. Total cash and cash. You, you, sorry, you are taking about Sesu. Yeah, yeah, the Sesu business. What's the overall crores. cash? Sorry. Yeah, twelve hundred crores. Twelve hundred crores. So if I look at uh, slide number, um, you know, thirty-four of your PPT, the overall debt in Sesu is ninety crores, right? And the overall cash right now is twelve hundred crores. So is it right for me to say that the takeover of Setsu has led to a cash infusion of 1100 crores? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's only a very accounting way of looking at it because at the end of the day, this is restricted cash. This cannot be just freely used. So, but your net debt amount would would include the 1100 cash of Setsu, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so then, so on this 1100 cash of Setsu, you would also be earning other income. Yes. Then, yes. Then it deployed. Yes, but it will be safe, a safe haven security, so it will not be a very high level of income, etc. So, out of the 34 crores spat that we've done on 3Q, how much of that is other income? Because on a 1100 crore number, even if I assume let's say a 5% uh, other income, I think you would be earning on the 34 crore number somewhere between 12 to 15 crores of other income itself. Is this is a pass through? So it won't accrue to oh. the bottom line. Oh, okay, okay, that's a pass through. All right, okay. And uh, so one question on the on the Delhi front, uh, you know, I think there is some impact of order that you've uh, that you've mentioned uh, in your PPT. So what is that? We, uh, will you repeat, please? Delhi. So the Delhi distribution front, you ah. mentioned that there ah. is an some order impact that's coming. That's about thirty-four crores. That is coming out of a tariff order. That's coming out of a tariff order. Okay. And just one last question, maybe on the Sesu front. Uh, I think the three Q numbers include um, include the takeover of Sesu, right? So within four Q, we've also taken over Westco as well as uh, uh, Southco, right? Yeah. And we'd also be taking over Nesco. So, what would be the you know cash infusion that would come in then? 
uh, so, so let's say SETCO has around 1100 crores. So, so net debt has actually benefited by around 1100 crores because of SETCO coming in. So would it be fair to assume that there would be another somewhere between 2000 to 3000 crores of um, you know, cash infusion in a way that will happen because of takeovers of these three entities? Uh, the other two, this, other three discounts, by the way, the third discount is yet to be really contrasted, but the two discounts, we are yet to get the final balance sheet, etc. So we won't be, uh, at present, what we have is only SESU. And it may or may not have that level of balances also. Okay. So there's a process going on on the handing over, only when it is complete, we'll be able to know what exactly is the cash balance there. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for my. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sumit Kishore from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is, uh, at what uh, stage of approval is the amalgamation of uh, Mundra into the standalone entity? So right now we are uh, we are soon going to have, uh, in the next two weeks, we are going to have the shareholders, uh, closure of the shareholders uh, approval, uh, which is the NCLT uh, 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 called meeting. And uh, following that, uh, we will have to file the results of that shareholder results, and, uh, and then we will wait for the approval. So it's a very, very advanced stages of getting close. Okay, so one can assume it will be done in this financial year. Yeah, even if it is still over, uh, you know that it is effective April 20. So the yes. effect will be there before we close the accounts this year. Okay. And the uh, second question is, uh, uh, in your standalone uh, accounts in the uh, presentation, I noticed the other income of 700 crores. Um, what is driving that uh, other income? So uh, this is uh, dividend from subsidies, overseas subsidies, and it is getting, in the console, it gets eliminated. Okay, which overseas subsidy is giving such a big dividend? This is our, our, our shipping uh, subsidiary okay. post the uh, sale of our shipping assets. Got okay. it. Okay. And uh, the third question is, uh, after 19,480 crore debt at Tata Power standalone, um, what is the updated figure on the debt attributable to CGPL and uh, the debt attributable to the acquisition of uh, uh, wealth fund? Renewable, I don't know whether it's still relevant to isolate, but uh, you know it is 3900 for the Wellspun acquisition and uh, uh, about 8,000 about 8, crores can be attributable to CGPL because originally CGPL had about 13,000 odd crores, which has come down to 4,000 crores. Sure. And after I take these two buckets, the residual debt should largely be attributable to the license area. Uh, yes, yes. And of course, supporting investments uh, sure. that are made, for example, Odisha investments, some some amount will be there. So, yeah, broadly that is correct. Yeah. And uh, uh, if you could outline what is uh, now on the annual SRS CapEx is concerned over a one year. Uh, time for maybe in FY22. So if you if you take away the uh, renewable assets because that purely depends. We have currently let's say about a gigawatt, so about four thousand to five thousand crores of capex in the pipeline on renewables. But apart from that, the regulated businesses normally are around thousand to uh, around thousand crores. Uh, we do have a potentially a uh, higher number in transmission in Mumbai, but that is that will be known in maybe a month or so we'll be able to share, maybe in the next quarter call we'll be able to share the exact outlay for next year. But that's broadly the CAPEX plan. And the new businesses have very little CAPEX, uh, a couple of hundred crores at best. And yes, uh, we do have an FGD program close to 4,000 crores across our thermal units. So that will be staggered in next year and the year thereafter. 
Okay. Okay. And uh, finally, as a follow-up to one of the earlier questions, you mentioned the three billion rupees of revenue contribution in nine months from rooftop solar. If I were to look at rooftop solar plus micro grids plus EV charging and home automation, this total would be uh, approximately how much in revenue terms? Maybe five hundred, roughly five hundred crores. Why three would, would be? Uh, between rooftop and other products, and for a quarter it'd be about 250 crores. So for the quarter it's 250 crores. And uh, so, how do we evaluate profitability in in, in the customer-oriented businesses? Uh, I I know you're not going to give me a figure, but uh, uh, how do we think about profitability? No, I mean. Uh, ultimately, it will about the margins. What they are saying right now is that they are in early stages of uh, development. So once it stabilizes in terms of the initial capital and the infrastructure that you have to put in, then I think we can start talking about right now they are all in building stages. And we would have loved to put all of them in WIP and and, and, and KPEX, but, but accounting treatment doesn't allow. But strictly speaking, they are in very building stages. That is why we are we are not wanting to uh, kind of come to a conclusion on what the guidance on margins would be. And all these customer-oriented businesses are sitting in uh, um, Tata Power Solar. So except the uh, pumps, which uh, which is sitting in Tata Power Solar, others are in standalone, but we are going to merge Tata Power Solar also, as you know. So effectively, yeah. all these new businesses will be in, in the standalone period. Standalone. Okay. Thank you and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Atul Tiwari from City Group. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, sir, my question is on your longer term strategy. So, uh, so a few months ago in the annual analyst meet, you kind of laid out uh, the path to improving the consolidated ROE to a much higher level. Uh, if I remember correctly, 12-13% plus. Uh, but at the same time, you are deploying a lot of capital in the renewable business. And if I look at a year-to-date FY21 PAT of about 254 crores, this is basically console renewables without TPC, on a net worth of about 8,000 crores, the annual ROE appears, uh, on the operating capacity, ROE appears to be less than 5%. And we are deploying even more capital behind a business where Based on the current evidence, ROE appears to be less than 5%. So how do you reconcile the two? Uh, you know, because on one hand, the, uh, the business appears to be pretty suboptimal ROE. And at the same time, we have laid out this vision to of increasing consolidated ROE to a much higher level. Okay. So there are two important aspects to it, right? One is structurally these businesses have a certain curve uh, um, when it comes to ROE. The initial period because of uh, interest, depreciation, and deferred tax, they generally tend to have a very low ROE to start with in the first three, four years. Then as repayment starts happening and the tax rewinding happening, the ROEs grow. This is one issue. But, but that doesn't mean that there is no equity return because the cash generation is strong. And all this, just you, you, when you put back and you see the overall return on the cash which is redeployed, then the ROE is very different. That is one point. Second is the whole concept to be innovate. We are doing only to take care of the aspect because our invested equity outside of the balance sheet of Tata Power will be only our share in the invert. And the invert is designed to give a certain flat and regular yield. That then becomes straight away a high yielding uh, equity, right? So that's the whole idea. And by also the premium that you get on selling the asset to the invest also helps you to reduce your capital invested and therefore increase the ROI. So the whole idea behind this whole plan of invest, et cetera, is to overall uh, really jack up the returns on the invested equity in these assets. And therefore, uh, our target is still absolutely on course on, on, on trying to develop our uh, returns on equity. So, sir, for this 2700 odd megawatt operational capacity, what would be the state of weighted average uh, life as of now? I mean, for how long time they have been operational? Uh, any kind of rough number? Is it like five, six years or less than that? Or it, more than it, that? 
uh, yeah, average age would be five uh, five years around five years. I think we will so have even after even after five years we are having five percent ROE, and obviously the project would have started execution maybe eighteen months earlier. So maybe we are looking at like seven years project kind of first hit the ground. And we are doing five percent ROE. So, don't you think it will kind of hinder your, uh, you know, journey towards a much higher consolidated ROE? I mean, X of this uh, inbuilt transaction, inbuilt transaction, of course, will boost the ROE. But on an ongoing organic basis, uh, you know, if project even after seven, eight years is giving you just five percent ROE, uh, you know, it's very difficult to reach a twelve, thirteen percent consolidated ROE in that kind of business. Right? So I think we have to sit with you with the math, but the point is that there are two, three issues which you are forgetting that in the, some of these assets we already kind of repaid loans, so that has been taken away. Then the net worth is not the right uh, denominator because the invested ROE is much lower, and um, and 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 therefore, uh, if your question is whether the long-term returns are are answerable, the answer is yes, they will add up. Uh, they will add up. And uh, you will have to see probably the life, the entire life um, cycle of the return, then it will match up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rajesh Majumdar from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, many thanks for taking my call, sir, and uh, congratulations on the good set of numbers. Uh, not just the numbers, but also the disclosures made in the PPT as well as the Excel file sent to us on the results, much appreciated. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, on the uh, free cash flow side, uh, can we get a figure for the 31st December free cash flow for the company? Yeah, so, we have about, about uh, 40 crore in the before CapEx. We've generated about 3,600 crores, 3,500 crores. That's the so we have a run rate of about 700, 1,200 crores per quarter. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, Mr. Majumdar, please self mute your line while your question has been answered. The table December, the cash flow the statement figure. Sorry, we didn't hear you. Uh, I'm saying, I uh, what is the free cash flow figure at the end of 31st December? Yeah, so free cash flow for this year is about 3,500 crores before capex. Before capex. Yeah, and capex was around 2,000 crores. We have 1,500 crores of free cash flow. Right. So, uh, what is our target of free cash flow generation given all our uh, upcoming projects? Uh, given that the fact that we have a, a capex program of for nearly 5,000 crores odd per annum across all the regulated businesses, uh, mostly. Yes, if we include all the SCD projects, yes, could be done. Yes. So, uh, no, I, my, my, I got a question: Is uh, what kind of uh, fee cash flow will generate, and what would be our dividend policy if we account for 5,000 crore kind of uh, capex every year? I think well, I won't be able to give you a forward-looking statement like that. All, all we are saying is our plan includes, remember next year, our ability to pay dividends and accommodate a higher, the higher, because of two, three things. One, the full effect of interest savings. It is our dilution in the renewables business would give us further cash. And that, that means our cash generation increases. Therefore, our ability to uh, have cash other than the equity that we have invested on this capex will be much higher, and therefore the dividend paying ability would be definitely better. So that is how our plan is uh, calibrated. And remember that we still have a lot of room in terms of debt. We 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 are going to be very very low on debt equity both the invest. So therefore, we have a room there to to invest without investing further equity. So, right. that's plan for you. Okay. Uh, my, my second question is on the regulated business side. Uh, if you look at your planned program uh, on the TND side, Mumbai and Delhi is going to account for nearly 12,000 crores over the next five years, if I'm not mistaken, till FY25, as per your uh, program. And uh, the last three years, we have just invested 
around 5000 crores in these two circles so given the size of these circles uh, is there any risk in terms of the regulatory capex that we're going to do in these circles or can you give us a broader game plan on this i think our long term plan which we had shared uh, during the study we had two three elements which is beyond the current businesses one is the odisha uh, uh, circle uh, plus expected expansion and plus uh, a certain high, uh, a certain a specific program in mumbai transmission which was a significant capex plan which is going to happen which is not comparable with the past so all this put together is what that plan was so that significant capex program is you don't uh, obtain any kind of approval issues in that basically that's what they're getting at sir your voice was a little muffled can you repeat it Yeah, I'm saying on the significant capex in Mumbai, I think it's about six thousand crores. You don't apprehend any kind of uh, 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 approval issues in that. No, uh, because we believe that there is a there there is a need for that capex, and we expect that it will get approved because there is a need of the art right now. In any case, sir, we uh, we spend this money only after we get the principal approval. So only after the state transmission unit and the uh, regulator approve it we go ahead and uh, execute these orders so uh, they are to that extent protected that we will get the regulated data right no no i'm just saying that if you are going to get the regulatory approval or not because a large part of our uh, growth uh, in the regulatory business depends on that capex no you are right i think this has been after considering the the entire network plan for the next 5 years there is a clear need that is emerged uh, in our assessment and we believe that there is a very good good case that the regulator will approve it because we know the we know what, why the capex is required okay in fact for the next 2 years already 2000 crores have been approved so for next 2 3 years they have already approved a large amount of capex plan okay Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the scheduled time. I now hand the conference over to Dr. Sinha for closing comments. So, uh, thank you to all of you for joining us for the call. And uh, uh, wherever you have more questions, uh, my colleagues uh, will be more than happy. Kasturi and Rahul Shah uh, can. offline take these questions and respond to all of you and uh, uh, we look forward to receiving your feedback and improving the services that uh, we can provide especially considering that we have a long term strategy and uh, your feedback is important for implementing it so once again thank you and uh, look forward to interact with you again thank you Ladies and gentlemen on behalf of Tata Power that concludes this conference thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines